So good evening and welcome to Become a Better Man. My name is Tunde Disus. Thank you so much for taking time to be part of today's program. And guess what? I've got a treat for us today. There is a treat in store for us. In fact, for the rest of this month, we're going to just be having one treat after another, after another, after another. It's going to be a great, great rest of the week on this platform. And I can assure you that. Because we've got some guests lined up that are coming to be a blessing to all of us, to, to help us along this path, to show us what it means to become a better man and a better woman in areas that we, we haven't considered at all. And I'm, I'm just sending out a, a, a signal now that uh, uh, very soon we'll have uh, Dr. Shegun Fatima on this program too. So be... On the lookout, all of you, we're going to have a great, great blessing today. We have a guest. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait for this guest to come on. But I, I've, <laughs> I've just been so excited all day. It's going to be great. But before I bring on the guest, let me remind us quickly where we are. Last week, in fact, this, the whole of this month, we have dedicated it to looking at health looking at health in different areas and, and looking at different things that we know we don't take care of or we don't know we're not aware of. So on today's program, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at mental health, mental health, the awareness that we need. What do you know? If I ask you what you know about mental health, a lot of us, all we know is about what we knew back home if you are from Nigeria or any part of Africa. Where people that have this this illness are, they are regarded as outcasts. They are regarded as not worthy to be alive. And so we're going to be looking deep into what is mental health. What are the lessons we need to learn as those of us who, by God's grace, are not suffering with that illness? How can we help our brothers and our sisters who are in that situation now? And let me tell you something, as I was preparing for this program, one of the startling things that I found, oh, our friends on uh, on uh, Instagram, sorry, I nearly left you behind. Let me add them to the show. There we go. Our friends on Instagram are now joining us. And as I was saying, as I was preparing for this program, I came across a lot of things that really challenged my understanding of mental health, that also helped me to understand some of the things I've taken for granted, some of the things that I have said, I, the way I have behaved, some, some prejudice that I had before. I was challenged so much this week that I, I've had to repent and, and ask God to forgive me because of ignorance. So today it's going to be, uh, uh, we're all going back to school. Because the guest we have with us, with us today, he's a, he's, a, he's a guru in this field. And I'm going to tell you some few things about him before I bring him on. But let me just quickly, as a way of introduction, say one or two things. Mental illness is real. Mental illness is as real as any other physical illness that you, you know. Medical, sorry, mental illness is as real as somebody who has cancer. It's as real as somebody who has headache. It's as real as somebody who has ulcer. It's as real as somebody who has a, any form of disability. Mental heal, illness is as real as any other illness that man can suffer. And so, with anybody that is suffering, anybody that is that is faced with that uh, 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 challenge in life, it doesn't just affect that one person. It affects them. It affects their friends. It affects their family. It affects their, their neighbors. It affects the whole community. Everybody that is around them, everybody that, that is associated with them, is involved, is, 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 uh, is affected. And so we're going to be looking, to, looking at all of this today. But according to the World Health Organization, they say mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities. This is mental health, not mental illness. That's one of the things I learned today. 
the difference between mental health and mental illness. So mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities. They can cope with the normal stresses of life. They can work productively and fruitfully, and they are able to make contribution to their own community. But mental illness, on the other hand, is different. It's, it's actually the reverse of what mental health is about. But I'm not a doctor, and I've never claimed to be one. Let me invite on, onto the platform today our guest. Tonight we have with us a man that I have a lot of respect for, a man that has spoken personally into my life, a man that has contributed immensely to my journey, a man that has stood with me when things were virtually falling apart. I have a lot of honor and respect for Dr. Muiwa Olumoroti. Who is Dr. Olumoroti? Dr. Olumoroti is a consultant psychiatrist and he has been practicing as a medical doctor in this country for over 26 years. But 12 years out of those 26, he has been a consultant in the NHS. He has worked in general adult mental health services. He has operated at different levels of security and forensic psychiatric care. And he's a fellow of the healthcare leadership through the NHS Leadership Academy. There's so much I can say about Dr. Lumoroti, but let me bring him on so that he can tell us by himself who he is, what he is, what he knows, how he knows it, and what he's doing in the community to help these people. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me bring Dr. Olumoroti on. Yes, I want to add him. Uh, doctor, if you could. So first, all our friends on Instagram. Uh, you might. Ooh, here we go. Can everybody see Doctor is in the house? The doctor will see you now. Doctor, good evening, sir. How are you, sir? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I know you are a very, very, very busy man. And for you to have taken this time out to be with us, it's an honor. And we appreciate you. Thank you so much. How is Dr. Doctor? We're all fine. Thank you, sir. His wife is a doctor, too. So when I see both of them, I say, hello, Dr. Doctor. We thank God for the blessing that you have been to us as a family, to me as an individual. And tonight, we are ready. We want to sit back. We want to learn from you. We want to hear your experience. We want to have understanding because ignorance is no bliss, as they say. It's one of the unfortunate things about life. The things we don't know, they are the things that rob us of, of, of all the blessings and advantages that we have. So tonight, Doctor, We've had some people sent in questions, but before we get to those to that, I want you to tell us, introduce yourself, and tell us what is mental illness or mental Thank health you very generally, and give us what are the awareness that we need to take on board as citizens, as brothers and sisters, to all these people that are facing this challenge in their various homes. All yeah, thank story. you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate your invitation. And um, well, I think I don't know where to start. I mean, mental health. When people talk about mental health, uh, the the essential word is the word mental. That has to do with the the brain, the attribute of the brain that affect the way we do things and our behavior. Okay. And I I'm happy you mentioned about mental health first before you talk about mental illness because. Uh, as WHO says, yes, there's no mental, there's no health at all uh, without mental health. Yes. If you don't have any mental health, no matter how good your kidney is, uh, you will not have a good life. So wow. you will not even be able to appreciate the fact that you have anything. Yes, so that's where the issue of mental health comes from. Um, I think it's important to think about our mental health because um, everything we do depends on that. Uh, so, so to say, um, people have to actually take care of their own mental health. People, they're quite easy to look after what they can see. Particularly, uh, I tell people every time, if you are going out on the road and you knock your leg on the pavement and it's swollen, 
you have to come back home that day. You couldn't go to work. That's right. The people, even when they are stressed, they are mentally unwell, they still want to carry on as if nothing is happening. Hmm. So, because there's no plaster or bandage <laughs> attached to, to cover head, that, <laughs> to cover that, so people don't appreciate that and they want to carry on until they get to a point of breakdown. So, wow. we really need to look after to our, our after our mental health. So, doctor, in that case, are you, if I understand what you're saying, so it is possible that there are more people who are mentally ill, but don't either don't realize it or they are ignoring it. Both of them. A lot of people are healed without knowing. Hmm. A lot of people know they have some idea something is not well, and they just ignore it. They, they, they try to do other things rather than address the issues. So on both sides, there, there are people falling into those kind of two categories: people that are not aware at all, or ignorant of the, those things, or people that just ignore them. Wow. So, in that case, then. What can you tell us about, just talk to us like we are in your classroom now. Just tell us about what it is, how it is, what causes it, what's responsible for it, how do we know about it, what are the symptoms, what can we do about it. Just generally, we are sitting at the, at the foot of your table now to learn, doctor, please. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to know where to pitch the explanations, but I will try to be generous as much as possible because I don't know who I'm talking to. Some people that I'm talking to already, they might have an idea. Some people don't have too much idea, but I'll pitch at the level of everyone. I think um, I, I want to look at it this way. If you put, uh, if you put water in a bucket. Yes, sir. And you, kept on, you keep on filling it. Yes, sir. You fill it. And you fill it. After a while, that water will spill over. That's right. Summer. Uh, the brain is the seat of where all the mental activities is coming from. And if you have had the opportunity to look at the brain before, I have, I have the privilege of looking at human brain, wow. uh, life, people that are life and people on operating table have seen them in neurosurgery before. It's a very delicate organ that is containing billions of neurons working together. And um, if, I mean, just like a car or a computer, you remember when you are trying to do something in a computer and everything sort of freezes or go yes. wire. The brain is like a supercomputer. So they are supposed to work in a certain way whereby you have the structural element in the nerves, you have the chemical elements, the, the receptors that are taking the impulses. So it's just like a computer everything is meant to work in a certain way. And whether due to structural problems, chemical problem, the connections, the firing, the way they function, if they don't function that particular way where they're meant to be functioning, then something has gone wrong. So the general thing I always talk about mental health for people to notice is that a lot of people are under stress. And many wow. times that's where, that's where it comes from. Uh, we generally you have a lot of people under stress and people have three jobs four jobs, to live having many life. projects, and uh, they are trying to play superwoman or superman, and they're trying to juggle one thing to the, to, together, together. Some people are running after money to, to make this money. Some people are trying to, trying to show off to other people that don't even appreciate them. Wow. And they stress themselves, they overwork themselves, and forgetting that the brain is a supercomputer. After a while, something will give because you are stretching yourself beyond your capacity. Wow. And that's where a lot of problem comes from. Uh, people sometimes have, for example, we talk about depression, anxiety. Those are the common things that people, uh, uh, that people, people uh, I mean, experience. For yeah. instance, you have, somebody, you have somebody who who is holding a lot of money. And the first thing they do is they, they breathe. <sighs> and uh, the way to solve money problem is not to be breathing him, ha, ha. It's to pay the money back. Well, <laughs> it's not to, you know. So when people then bite more than what they can chew, they become anxious. And they keep on thinking of so many things in their mind, so many thoughts going through their mind, and um, become anxious. Some people cannot even tell you what they are anxious about. 
And when they're anxious, they are panicking, they are afraid, they think something bad is going to happen to them or happen to their family. Mm. They might lose their home, they might lose their job. So anxiety creeps in. And if this is not managed, after a while, depression will set in. So people might become depressed and feel sad in their mood, really low in their mood, not able to function in the energy. They don't enjoy their life the way they should enjoy it. So a lot of symptoms, I could sit here till tomorrow and be telling you about symptoms of mental health, but they're quite yeah, common. Yeah. People are tired. I was, Fatigue, going to say before we, I was going to say before we get into the symptoms, um, I just want to, I want, I want to build it up so that we can all flow uh, in the same direction at the same pace. One of the things, as I was doing my research and preparing for this, uh, for this program, one of the, some of the revelations that I found was, for instance, they said one in four people over their lifetime will experience common mental health problems. Some are not full blown. Some are just so silent. Some will be there and will never come up. And some will just come and and go eventually. But to find out that one in four of us, if you count one, two, three, the third person is likely to have issues with their with with the mental health. That 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 is frightening, doctor. But how come such such statistics is not readily available or is it are they there we're just not paying attention to them but the, stat the statistics have always been there it's just that what one person might consider to be a mental illness mm. another person might just think it's normal life so they are there and they affect our lives generally so like i said the the commonest mental illnesses are the common disorders the anxiety the panics the depression uh, it's not until when somebody goes to hospital and admitted into a mental hospital that they have mental illness. Stress, crippling stress. Some people are stressed, they cannot function at work. Some people are, they are, they are, they are stressed, they cannot function in family. They get hungry, they get irritable, they get panicky, they get depressed, they blame other people for so many things. So the, those statistics are there. They are real life, they are, they are there. It's just that people don't pay attention to them. My, my concern is that people try to put things under the carpet until the, cat, the carpet actually erupts <laughs> before they, 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 they get help. Yeah, but having said that, though, do you think, doctor, from your experience and knowledge, do you think the issue with stigma and prejudices that people who have or come out openly or who's been diagnosed or who people know to have this problem, the stigma that goes with it, the shame, the, the public humiliation that goes with that, do you think that contributes to why people don't want to come out and say, look, I need help? Yes, definitely. Stigma is a big problem, which uh, uh, over the many years I've been around here, it's been tackled every day. Stigma is always an issue. How do people respond to, I think the image people have for people that with, with mental illness is somebody that, that has uh, a big challenge whereby they are talking gibberish, they are <laughs> very frightening, they are holding a cutlass or a machete, for instance, and they are biting people right. around. That's, that is not it. So that's the kind of picture people have in their mind. But because this stigma is there, even when people have things they should seek help for, like stress, like anxiety, like depression, you know, like OCD, because people might judge them, you know, negatively. They would rather not say it. Even in families, a husband or a wife is going through some issues, he will not allow his family to even know about what is going on so that they can seek help. You know, so it's, it's the stigma is a big is a big problem. And I'm, I'm sure you'll have seen in the in the papers and in the news recently, all sort of initiative of a stigma being tackled at work in among men, among women. So it's always a challenge. And I think a, a lot of work things to be done about stigma so that people can come out if they have challenges. Also, doctor. Oh, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you are watching, if you have any question you want doctor to attend to, to talk about, please, by all means, send, send in your question. Obviously, we might not be able to answer all of them, but as much as possible, we will tackle, we will try to touch as many of them as possible because we are all learning on this platform. And for our friends who are on, uh, uh, on Instagram, unfortunately, I can't share doctor with you as well on Instagram. So if, uh, if you don't mind, if you want to cross over to the Facebook page so that you can see, but if you just want to hear what they saying, I'm sure you can hear it. And I appreciate you, you for that. 
Doctor, the next thing I wanted to talk about, I wanted to ask you is, where we come from, Africa generally, Nigeria specifically, the issue of mental illness is seen as, um, it's even worse than a taboo. It's like a curse on that person or that family or that region or, and all of that. Is it possible then that there are people, especially within the black community or the ethnic community, the brown community, that this mentality of what we we all grew up to know as uh, oh, that person is going to be off the rocker. Could that be responsible also for why, why people of minorities, uh, uh, ethnic minorities, why they're not coming out? Because when I was doing this study, I found out that about 60% more prevalent among the uh, ethnic minorities than the native uh, 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 indigenous of this country suffer from this mental illness. Yes, uh, I think the, one of the first things to mention is that the prevalence of mental illness is the same all, all over the world. Whether you are black, blue, or white, it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that the, the approach to, to heat in different cultures is different. Uh, yeah. Whether you go to Asia, India, I mean, America is the same. But how we approach it differs. Uh, the level of taboo and uh, stigma is different in different areas. Now, if you remember what me and you grew up with in that part of the world is yes, sir. the picture of a, the picture of a what you call it, a, 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 a madman yes. who is naked in the street, who is uh, chasing people around or who they are chasing around, they are chasing they are, they are somebody who is being chased around. You yeah. know, that's the kind of picture that, that we have. So when you talk about mental net, that the first picture that goes to people's mind is that picture. Is that, is that so, picture that, of that's, people down the... in, in chains and handcuffs in exactly. somebody's house. Yeah, and that that's happens in, uh, you know, it's happened before, it happened in hospital, even there are hospitals in Nigeria today. In Nigeria, in other parts of the world, they are still locking people down with chains. And uh, yeah. yes, in, that's, the, that's the going on in, in part of Africa, it's still going on in part of Asia. So it's taboo everywhere. In the West, it, um, that is not something that we see, you know, at least I've never seen that since I've been in this country. But mm -hmm. that's the kind of picture that people have in their mind. And this can affect whether you want to disclose to somebody, whether you you have some challenges and you don't want to be seen as somebody who is, I mean, they use the word mad. We don't like to use that word, but that's the, that's the kind of picture that people connote in their mind. Yeah. If you say something, yeah. people might say you are mad and that might affect you negatively. So it's, it's a problem in, in traditional cultures more than that, that the West here. The West, they are more open, even though there are still a lot of pockets of stigma, even in the West, but in the West, they are more open to try to accept that we have a challenge here, we need to look into it, but in, in, in the traditional cultures, the tendency is to have people want to suppress it and hide away from public. In fact, in some places, they will not give you a wife to marry if they know that there's a mental illness in your family. Yeah, I, I, I was talking to a friend uh, during the week about this program, and he was relating to me that uh, his, his friend was going to marry this particular lady, and his friend's parents said, no, you can't marry into that, from that family because they have a tendency towards the old age to go mental. And they think if you marry that lady, it will eventually come into, our own into their own family too. So don't go there and all of that. But that could be something that happened as a result of any of these symptoms that you've been talking about today. It doesn't mean there's a, or could it be gen gen genetic? Yeah, there, there, there's a genetic predisposition to, to mental illness. So, again, like I said, it's ignorance because uh, some illnesses have strong genetic link. And some of them that do not have any genetic basis can present the same way like somebody that has a genetic link. So how do you know the difference oh, of that? Different. So, so yeah. if, people, if somebody has been asked not to marry from that family because of that, and the fact that somebody has something in one family doesn't mean that the other people will have it. Because it's not just uh, one plus one equals to two. Uh, there are multiple factors uh, that, that affect whether somebody has mental illness presentation or not. If somebody has it in, in their family, if they live in an environment that is conducive, they are well supported, they have a good job, they have a good family, that person in their life may not even show any, any symptom. 
So it's like a bucket phenomenon. If you keep on filling the bucket, so somebody that has a genetic predisposition in their family, who is now living in the poverty, who is now who is now being oppressed, who doesn't have a job to do, who has a low self-esteem of themselves, you could see how the bucket is filling up. <laughs> He's getting that person filled. might, yeah, that person might have. Uh, mental disorder, but somebody who doesn't have that, who has a good life, may not even experience that at all. So it, it, there's no one factor. It's just that people are ignorant of it, and I think that's where the education is necessary. Thank you, Doctor. Again, going back to what you said earlier on about stress, the truth is the environment that we all live in today, either at work, at home, at church, in the society, we are all pressed more than it used to be. There is so much pressure on anybody that's working now to produce results with less resources, with less time to do it. So there is that squeeze, as it were, especially coming from work. But added to that is the stress of people who don't have a job. Now, if you look at those two, it, it is not surprising, therefore, that people's stress level is high. How can, how, how do you address that? Or how do you pick that sign up, say, in your friend? And what do you do to help that friend in that situation? Well, I'll try to be practical. I, I have had the privilege of uh, giving... Uh, uh, talks and training on stress in a few places. Mm. I think you have to distinguish between what you have control over and what you don't have control over. The greatest commonest causes of stress in people is when they don't have a control over their life, particularly at work. Okay. So, for instance, uh, I'll go back to the bucket phenomenon again. Yes, sir. The more you put in the bucket, the quicker it fills up. And if you yeah. keep on filling the bucket, it will spill over at some point. So yeah. say for instance, um, you are employed as a clerk and you end up having four children and then you want to have the five, fifth, fifth child. The question is, how are you going to manage the family? Mm -hmm. Apart from the physicality of looking after children, the emotional part of looking after children, the financial part of, of it, you have to work for, for to, I mean, before they can start working for themselves. So. You could see pressure is there. Mm. I, I can see one of our people on the on the system is talking about prayer pressure. Yes, I, I used to talk about people. Um, they come to this country. They see people that have been here for ten years or twenty years, and they, they have a big house. They too want to buy a big house on a small salary. Uh, I've seen people want to go and buy no salary <laughs> or no salary. So, <laughs> so some things you have control over. Some things you don't have control over. So things that I have control over, I manage it. So do I have control over whether I borrow money or not? I do. You know, I don't have to buy every ashwabi every time. You know. Come on now. What's the point of buying ashwabi that you never wear? What's the point of buying a big car and park in front of your house when you always travel to central London to work? And don't forget, once you pay for the, once you get the contract for the car, you have to pay for it. And uh, the good thing about this country is that everything is from direct debit. Whether you like it or not, the money will come out of your money. So at the end of the day, there's nothing to, to go by. So those are things that people have control over. For instance, I drive a very small car because five, six out of seven days, I my car is at home. So why should I go and buy a 30,000 pounds car and park in front of my, of, my, of my house? So I do have control over that. I do have control over the friends I keep so that I don't get under peer pressure. So those are things I have control over. I do have control over. Uh, uh, con con control over the kind of work I do, you know, even at work where we may be employees and juniors, you do have a control over how you do your work. What I found out is that when you do your work, the tendency for people to push you around is less. But if you don't do your work, they push you around everywhere. So I see people moving from one job to another, blaming one person, blaming one. I said, look, if you leave six work and you are blaming everybody, why don't you sit down and ask yourself? What is your own problem in this in this in this situation? Do you actually do your work? So people then get sacked or get not promoted, they become stressed up. So a, a lot of things like that, particularly financial commitment, put a lot of people under stress. Uh, I can imagine people that have job are stressed enough, not to talk of people that don't have job. People that don't have work. 
So it's, 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 it's there. Stress from family and friends, you know. You know, wannabes. Thank you, know, you people doctor. People want to be other, like other people. Mm. Mm. Let's look at some of the, the manifestations of or symptoms uh, that you were, you were, um, uh, you alluded to earlier on. You've talked about stress and pressure. Uh, can you talk to us about depression, please? Mm. Depression is one of the topics that is uh, sometimes, even though common, very difficult to describe. Because in different cultures, people express depression in different ways. Okay. Uh, in the English term, people might say you feel depressed or you feel low or you feel down. So you can see the word feel depressed, feel low, or feel down, down. Or, or feel sad. So depending on the language, people use different languages. But the, there are three things about depression, common symptoms of depression. Uh, the cardinal symptom in my book, in my psychiatry work. Okay. Um, people feel sad or low in their mood. So people might tell you they're not, they're, they're not happy. They look worried. People might see them from afar and say, oh, you're not looking too good today. Mm -hmm. So that's one of them. The second thing is that they have less energy. You know, they just feel tired. Small thing, they, they are very tired. So that's another thing to look at in depression. And the third one is that they, they don't enjoy things. They, they, they do, you know, they don't like to go out. They enjoy things. Things they do, they don't enjoy it anymore. So you first see all those, uh, you know, cardinal, cardinal symptoms in depression, whereby people sort of, have low energy, low mood, and lack of enjoyment in their life. That's the first thing people see. And then on top of that, things like anxiety. People get anxious. People feel worried. People get irritable. People get hungry sometimes, you know. Um, for no reason, somebody gets very edgy. You say, good morning. You say, why are you calling me like that? Why, why are you calling me like that? People might, people might feel a bit edgy. What's good in the morning? Yeah, it, 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 in that way. And then when they start having that, people can then talk about uh, about other things they, they are experiencing. People find it a, a lot of headache, sometimes headache, tiredness, lack of sleep. You can't sleep. You feel anxious. Some people cannot eat. They don't want to eat food anymore. They lose their self-esteem, their sense of, of being a human being. They, they feel dejected. Some people can find out what caused it. Some people don't know what exactly caused it. And if this goes on for a long time, even husband and wife, they find that relationship in family intimacy become suffer in, 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 in the family. And uh, to the point that people sometimes they don't start feeling like they don't want to live anymore. And wow. these are the things that people start experiencing. And if care is not taken, I've seen people, you know, who then want to attempt to take their own life or actually take their life. So depression is a serious thing, but it doesn't just start in one day, start gradually until, uh, until things go out of hand, if people don't address that. One of the things, thank you, sir. One of the things I've also noticed is that depression is almost like uh, like we're talking about mental illness, which depression is part of. It's almost becoming uh, a, 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 a taboo or, or a stigma to say this person have depression or this person is depressed. And so people tend to hide it, pretend, and even go as far as into denial that they are not depressed, when all the signs are there that this person is on the downward spiral. In a situation like that, where you know, well, obviously, you're not a doctor. Well, we are, you are a doctor. <laughs> Those of us who are not doctors, we can't, there's no way we can medically or clinically de 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 diagnose a person to be having depression. But there should be a way by which we can approach that person. Can you tell us from your experience how to go about that? Because the truth is, when you look around you, each and every one of us on this program, even as we're talking, you can count at least two, three people that you know that are displaying the symptoms that doctor has just spoken about. How do you approach such people? How, what do you say to them? How do you help them? Hmm. I think two things to, th to, to note about you, you, two things that will affect whether how you approach people is one, your relationship with them mm -hmm. and the responsibility you have towards them. Okay. Because you can't just approach a stranger to say, you look depressed, you need to do something <laughs> about it. You might get a slap. <laughs> so, I get so it. I, <laughs> I think it's, it's relationship. 
I'll give you an example. If you have a colleague at work, yes, sir. who used to be very smart, do their work, mm. and suddenly you notice that they're coming into work, they're not dressing very well like they used to do, they're not greeting people, they don't look very happy like, like the way they used to be. Yes, sir. Uh, if, if they are a work colleague, you find out that uh, a lot of people start making a lot of mistakes because of poor concentration, mm. or they're not giving their work in good time. So if you have a good relation with that kind of person, you 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 are you are in a position to say, my friend, uh, I want to, uh, I have noticed certain things has been happening. Is anything is everything all right? Most people will tell you everything is all right when everything is not all right. That's the mm. that's the kind of tendency what people would do is to say everything is fine everything when is fine. it's not fine. But if you can actually give specific, undeniable example what you have seen, yeah, and in them and that you are. As much as possible, you're not trying to poke nose into the affair, but as a good friend, as a good work, co work colleague, as a good family member, as a good church member, you yeah. have noticed these things that actually not in them before, and you think everything might not be all right. Are they able to confide in you in that way? Now, mm -hmm. the challenge that most people here is, have is that, like you said, stigma. If I, conf if I, if I confide, in, confide in somebody, yeah. that I'm going through the trouble. Would this news end up on BBC the next day or in the evening? Or Facebook. So, or Facebook. Yeah. yeah it's so, <laughs> so people people might then start to worry about if I tell somebody this is my challenge. Yeah. I I are they going to keep the confidentiality? But the, the the relationship we have with people is what helps us to 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 know how to broach things with people. Mm -hmm. And and also our knowledge, because if you don't have knowledge about what we are seeing, what mm -hmm. might be causing it it might be difficult to us to broach it. The other issue is the issue of responsibility. If I'm a teacher in school and a child who has always been very bright, you know, coming to school, yeah, you know, so become very silent, very withdrawn, not going out during the break, yeah. not associating with other children, then you, you will know that something is wrong. So something is not adding are, up here. Yes, teachers and other people in authority, they are actually being trained to act to spot signs of depression Somebody will become withdrawn. They're not doing, they're, 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 they're not their normal self, what you've seen them to be, or mm. things have just gone so low. And when people are depressed, their face is down. You know, you could, you could see their face is down. Or even some people try to cover their depression with overactivity. They become more <laughs> they active. They become hyperactive. Yeah, they become hyperactive to be compensate for, so that people don't know what is on. But you can see something is wrong in that, in, in that situation. But you, it's your responsibility and your relationship that will help you to know how to appreciate. And also your, your no knowledge about what depression is might help you to, to do that. Thank you so much, doctor. Guys, I hope I, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I mean, this is helping me because like I said, we are not, none of us is living a, 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 on an island where it is just you, yourself and yourself. We live among people. Even in our own lives, in our own private lives, we, you, a lot of us can relate to some of the things doctor is talking about here tonight. And what we're not saying you are mad. We're just saying, if you have any of this issue, if you have noticed any of this within yourself, there is somebody in your life that you can talk to. If nobody else, talk to your GP. Because a stitch in time, they say, saves nine. Maybe if it is, if you, if you speak early, if you, are, if you seek help early, you will get help early and the symptoms can be treated and some of them can be eliminated. So please don't let us sit in silence and, and pretend all is well when the house is, is, when the roof is leaking and the carpet is floating on, on, on over six, six inches of water. Doctor, the next one I wanted to look at, another symptom that I found when I was preparing is... Uh, psychosis it, it is de described or defined as a severe mental disorder in which thoughts and emotions are so impaired that the contact that contact is lost with external reality can you tell us about that sir thank you very much i i think the easiest way to understand psychosis is uh, the word psychosis come from the word psych, meaning the mind. A situation whereby the mind is no longer, for whatever reason, is no longer in touch with reality. 
Wow. So it's a, it's a very broad area uh, of a, uh, you know, mental illness that uh, is very common. Uh, for example, in uh, society, uh, about one percent of people, you know, suffer from you know severe psychosis. Sometimes discovered schizophrenia. So what it, what that means is that something has happened in their life for whatever reason and they are not in touch with reality. Say for instance, somebody uh, is seeing things that other people cannot see and they are in a way responding to that. So mainly psychosis affects the way people think about things and the way they see things, the way they judge things and may not be normal anymore. So some of that are due to issue with genetic factors some of them can be caused by acute stress reactions. People can become psychotic because they are overstressed. Depression, when not tackled in good time, can lead to psychosis. Hmm. And drug use can lead to psychosis. People can become psychotic when they are taking alcohol too much wow. also. So there's a, it's, a, it's a big area of, uh, uh, of work in mental health whereby it needs to be addressed. And uh, it's not... Uh, rare as people might want to think it is. Psychosis mm -hmm. is common mm -hmm. in society. What about bipolar disorder, sir? Mm. Bipolar disorder is also a psychotic disorder. And if you look at the word bipolar, bipolar, two poles, two, two ends. Poles. Yeah. It means people, people might have tendency whereby their mood, the normal mood is what you call the normal mood. Their mood can be high and mood can be low. So mm -hmm. when people Ex exhibit these two aspects of fluctuation in mood. Yeah. One minute they might be down, the next minute they might be low in their mood. Mm. That's what you call bipolar illness. It's also a psychotic disorder. In bipolar illness, people might uh, start seeing things differently from, from what is exactly the truth. Uh, they might feel too depressed and behave in certain ways. They might actually feel too high and think uh, they are God or they are Jesus Christ, or they have a special mission in the world, okay. or, or they own yachts or ship or aeroplanes in, in places. They might want to say they are friend to the prime minister. They want to go and see the queen. So they might do wow. that in that way. So, so there's a, a higher hand. People might start doing things recklessly, become sexually disinhibited. You know, they might start spending money that they don't have. They might start behaving the way they don't, uh, they're not supposed to be behaving. So, so when people are very high, that kind of behavior is there. And when they are depressed, it's the depressive features also shows up. And it can be to different aspects. It can be very minor, it can be moderate, it can be severe. So that's what you call bipolar illness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Some of... <laughs> Please guys, I, I, I don't want to be the only one that's enjoying this. I want you to say something. Please type. If you have a question, please let us have it if you have a comment feel free to pass it if you if you if you have an opinion feel free to express it we are all learning on this platform uh i, I could have doctor talk about this till till next weekend because i'm i'm learning a lot one of the things i i found out which for me i'd never i have never related this to mental illness so you can imagine my shock and my 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 how dazed I was when I found out that eating disorder is a form of mental illness, like uh, 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 anorexia and bulimia. Apparently, it's a form of mental illness. Doctor, is that true? Well, that, that, I know. Yeah, that, that's that's true. Um, most people that. Are suffer from eating disorder, they don't, they don't just wake up one day and say, I'm, I'm going good. to have this eating, eating disorder. So there's something that's gone on in their, in their mind, in their social life, and um, whereby uh, the way they think about themselves as sometimes maybe overweight, the level of thinking about their weight is such that they have to then restrict how much they are eating. And this becomes a yeah. mental illness for them. So it's, it's a mental illness. On its own. Right. Somebody just asked, Doctor, that how can we treat or how can we care for someone with bipolar? Okay. 
the, the, the best care for bipolar, I mean, for me, is to try one to know what is it as we have tried to speak about it in this yeah. forum. Um, because somebody who has bipolar illness, um, particularly when people are very high, um, they themselves they don't know there's a problem. And uh, those okay. behaviors sometimes can pass for normal. Somebody, you know, start buying goods and, you know, talking about how good they are. So where do you draw the line between somebody who is actually experience, experiencing the reality in their life and somebody who is actually going overboard? So if somebody starts spending a lot of money or they do behaviors that uh, they, they act in ways whereby initially people around them don't see it as a problem. They think this guy is just happy. You know, mm -hmm. everybody likes to be happy. But after a while, you can see that this happiness, familiarity, friendliness go out of the way. Mm -hmm. And people people like to be familiar with people, but at the same time, after the while, you notice that we they all have know social... where, where your where your personal space is anymore. Yeah, you know where your boundary is, and uh, so over familiarity, high mood, you know, you know, garrulous behavior, you know. So people start noticing that. So how do you manage that? The first thing is to recognize that there might be a problem. Some people don't actually get into to to to, to treatment until they actually run into big trouble. Particularly borrowing money or using credit card to to maintain a lifestyle, go into relationships because they are happy and um, doing things you know that might be forbidden in law. So the first thing is to try and get them to get help. But to get help for somebody who doesn't appreciate they have a problem is actually a challenge on its own. Yeah, that's so I think I think the first thing to do is to try and. Uh, address it with them or possibly address it with them with somebody else who might actually have felt the same thing because the challenge with people that are high or bipolar is uh, in, in, in their mood, high in their mood, is that they don't see what you see as a problem, as a problem. So mm -hmm. until you start actually confronting them with hard facts about why what they are doing is actually getting them into trouble. So that is where the, the, this, is it. This, this is it. So the best thing is to first, like you said, let them see their GP and uh, talk to somebody about what they're saying. Even if they don't believe you, you might want to ask them to ask, actually have, go for a second opinion. Maybe if they hear what you are saying, again, from somebody or perhaps a professional, they might start believing what you are saying. So that's, it, that's it one of the ways to get help for people. And there's help there in that way because evidently you will find that what is happening is not normal even though some people might be in denial. Some people might actually realize that mm, something is going on wrong here. This is not the way I used to behave. A lot of people that with bipolar, when they are high, there's a lot of thoughts racing in their mind. They want to have many activities. Today, they want to be a footballer. Tomorrow, they're a film star. They want to do a sort of, a lot, all sort of ideas coming to their mind. Initially, people try to believe them that oh, maybe they are just being you know, very ambitious. But after a while, you notice that everything doesn't add up and, you know, people might then become depressed. Particularly when you see people that are bipolar, they are high one minute, the next minute they are tearful, they are crying. Some people might actually realize the, the damage they have caused to themselves, to their job, to their family. They become depressed and it can go on and on and on and on. So the best is to get them to their doctors to start and seek help. Oh, Father, help us. Somebody asked a question. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, mental health related. Uh, the question is, what's the cause of dementia? The, the, I'm not a specialist in holy psychiatry, but uh, I can tell you about the, the dementia. Uh, okay. Dementia uh, is, a, is a disorder that mostly comes in the, in the old age. Okay. Like I said, the brain is a supercomputer that is made up of different neurons, chemicals, and all the rest. So there are different types of dementia, but the easiest way to understand is that as we grow older, the way the brain functions you know, differs from the way when we were younger. And over a period of time, people might then start having issues with their memory, their concentration, their recognition of people, and the way they do things, and sometimes their behavior. So the, the causes can be a lot of different causes. Some of the causes are just due to hold it itself, without anybody being able to ascribe any cause to it. Yeah. Some of the causes are related to some of the insult and injury that people have suffered as a child or at, at some point. People that have had head injury in the past, they are more predisposed to having dementia than people that have never had 
head injury. So people that have things like encephalitis, so people that have any insult into their brain at one point or the other in their life are more likely to have different dementia than people who have not. But generally, dementia tends to happen as people grow older in age. So in itself, is something that is common in older adult people. Okay. I want us to look at some of the questions that were sent in, Doctor, um, because I'm just conscious of, of time. It, it, I'm, I'm amazed we're almost an hour into the program. But ladies and gentlemen, we may have to go slightly over the normal hour because obviously we can't cover everything in one, in one program. And doctor's time is is uh, it's precious. Uh, we're so blessed to have him here. So now that we have him, let's let's milk him for every <laughs> everything we can get out of him today. So please, we may go slightly over the hour period at uh, the normal one hour. Now the first question is: Can mental illness be described or diagnosed as a spiritual problem? or spiritual attack, or spiritual affliction? I'm going, to, I'm going to answer that question as a psychiatrist. Not as, uh, not as, a, not as a pastor. Okay. No, um, because uh, depending on where you are talking from, which culture you come from, which background you come from, mm. people ascribe different things to spirituality or attack or witchcraft or whatever it is. Yes, sir. But for me, a mental illness is a disorder of the brain. Whatever you think has caused it, that might be their own explanation. Okay. It's a disorder of the brain or the mind. People might say it's a disorder of the mind, whereby the way people function normally has been affected. So people's way of behaving, of thinking, or acting, or judging is been affected in an abnormal way. And that is mental illness. Whether people they want to say it is spiritual attack, or a, an attack, or an attack. that is the way they will explain it. But mental illness is mental illness all over the world. It's the same thing. So, I understand where you're coming from, but we can't deny, or I can't deny, and I think I speak to many of the viewers on, on this platform tonight, we can't deny the fact that we're, we're, we're Christians. And within the Christian dom, uh, the Christian cycle, or the Christian world, one of the things that people are very quick to uh, to blame for everything is spiritual attack, or like you said, witchcraft, or somebody somewhere is against you, and all of that. And so, when you find somebody who is having, who has a mental illness, and people from the Christian world are saying or trying to treat that as a spiritual illness where do you draw the line how do you help them why do you bring understanding to such to, to such people i've seen that many times in my career uh when i used to work in the i mean in the acute sector i see that a lot um even among christians when i see them for example in accident and emergency and somebody is mentally unwell uh what i say to them is that fortunately for me I know a bit of the Bible. So <laughs> when people talk about the Bible, I can I can relate to them. Yes, sir. I think for me, I'll deal with them as a psychiatrist. What I can see here in my description mm. is a mental illness. Whatever you think has caused it, that's your own belief. That's the way it is to you. But what we need to do is to provide a solution that is in an armamentarium to manage that situation. I will not stop people from praying. I will not stop people from, from reading the Bible. Mm. I will uh, ask them not to go to church. But while they are with me, I will interpret whatever symptom they are presenting with and manage it with the, with the, with the skills that I have and the treatment that I have. Don't forget, the Bible is not against treatment of mental illness. A lot of Christians, typically, they don't seek help until things go wrong. Mm -hmm. God, there are doc even in the Bible, there are doctors in the Bible. Yeah. Like so God Luke. does not ask us not to seek help. That does not stop us from praying. But 
when there's a challenge of mental health, that needs to be addressed. And if it's medication that I have in my hand as a doctor is what I can use to help that situation, that is what I give at that time. Okay. So I'm just trying to paint a picture here, uh, an hypothetical picture here. Say somebody who you can see from your professional knowledge and experience has mental uh, uh, problem. And therefore, the person is not in a position to make decision for himself or herself. But the people, the next of kin, the parents or the spouse that can take that legal position for that person are now saying to you as a doctor, well, we hear what you're saying, doctor, but our religious belief is that we don't believe in medical treatment or we don't believe in injection. We don't believe in blood transfusion or whatever the, the, the prescribed solution medically is. What do you do then? Well, the, my, my job is simple, uh, particularly in this jurisdiction where we live under the law. Yes, sir. Um, as much as possible, we want to work with families. We mm. want to respect their wishes and opinion. Mm. At the same time, as a doctor in hospital, I have a legal duty to act in the best interest of the patient. Okay. So where a person is of, the, of an adult age, yes, sir. and they are, in the position, they are not able to make decisions for themselves, the law allows a situation whereby they are seen by two doctors and a social worker who can decide that this person, they are not able to make decisions for themselves and in the, best, in the best interest to treat them so that things don't go out of hand, yeah. we manage that under the law. Uh, at times, sadly, we have to displace the interest of the uh, family or the carer sometimes, mm -hmm. particularly, uh, and we do this very carefully. But the issue is that a lot of times, families and carers who may not have a clear understanding or have a different understanding, they are acting based on their own understanding and a lot of emotions. Okay. Uh, but we deal with facts as much as we can see. So don't forget, we see a lot of these people every time and we mm -hmm. can almost say where things are at any particular point in time. So we may have to agree to disagree so sometimes. And, and living in a context like the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. we can we can displace families and carers in that way. Okay. Right. This one is a long question, but uh, I'm sure you will pick the, the, the meat out of, out of this. The question is, how can people get past the tough guy mentality, especially among men, and even more so among the, uh, men in service, like the military, the police, the firefighters, the sport personalities, who are actually going through mental illness but because of this macho stature that they have they don't want to admit it or they they they, they just don't know it how do you get past that that toughness that that front that i'm a i'm a strong person i can i can deal with this how do you what do you do as a family first how do you go past that in, in initial blockade I think in, in whatever circumstances, what, what should happen first is that it's very difficult for somebody to talk to somebody that you don't love initially before. Um, if you have been there with somebody, somebody is likely to listen to you when they are going through difficulties. If you have been there for them in the past, then if you just come up and start to tell them this is wrong. So that's why we need to, we need to cultivate relationship for sometimes in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of the days of adversity. Mm -hmm. So how do we get over people that don't want to get help, they want to have a macho? It's about reality pointing. If I can show you that this behavior, this presentation, this way of work over the last one week, one month, one year, is causing you serious problem. You are not meeting up to standard at work, wife has packed out of house and go somewhere else children are afraid to come home begin to let people see what challenges and the problems that they are facing because of their presentation or what they are trying not to agree or to accept so people might then begin to start to think about what is costing them 
Because like you said, a lot of people want to put up a good face, a macho mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. And it's not only in the, in the military. It, it happens in society among men mainly. Women are more likely to seek help. You know, men, in my experience, don't mm -hmm. seek help until things go out of hand. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you have a relationship whereby you can actually point out to, to them what exactly they are losing or they are missing or they are causing or what the kind of hurt they are causing mm. in their in their in their environment to people that are close to them they might then begin to see now one of the challenges is that people might they start blaming other people for their problems but after a while if you are in a position to speak to their life and show them what problems whatever they are presenting is causing them mm. they might begin to want to listen to you but what I said in, earlier on is that we don't wait till the day of adversity before we befriend somebody. We are already there for people. Many people that I've had opportunity to talk to in my life when they are going through challenges are people that have been their friends in the past. Mm -hmm. They have been close to them. You don't just show up to somebody. So when they are say, down on their knees and say, you need yeah, help. They're, they 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 not they yeah. like to listen they'll to you. Give you. They'll give you a vocal help. As yeah. Well. So I think it's good to be there for people when they when people and when it's good to have a good relationship with people initially, so that when things like this happen, you can go and say, "My friend, I noticed this is not happening. I noticed you have been feeling like this for some time. I noticed mm -hmm. this has been happening in your work, and this also goes on in family at work. If you are not there as as a good coworker, we then mm -hmm. see a colleague who is in trouble. You cannot really go to them and say you are in trouble." Yeah, but if you have, if you have a good relationship with them before, it's easier to approach. So that puts the responsibility initially on all of us yes. to show ourselves friendly, to care for one another, to 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 be there for others. Don't just be self-centered and only me, myself, and I. And then, because a day is coming when you will be the one that will need other people's help. And if all you've done all till now is just put your nose in the air, nobody can talk to you, nobody can see your eyes. When your time of need comes, who are you going to turn to? So it is important, ladies and gentlemen, for us to be, be, be human. We are all under one form of a demand on us or the other. There's a pressure here. There's a need there. There's a, an obligation there that all of us are running after. But in the midst of that, we must not lose sight of the people around us. And we must not let our past experiences to close our bowels of compassion. Because a day is coming when you will need people to be there for you. Now, Doctor, the issue there's an issue that is currently very ripe in, in society and it's been talked about generally, and that is the issue of domestic violence. I was speaking at a conference uh, in, in February, and it was a relationship conference, and one of the questions that came up was, is it true that men that a lot of men are going through or are experiencing domestic violence but are not being reported or they are not talking about it, just like more women are, are facing it as well. And what effect will domestic violence, whether to the man or to the woman, what effect or what can that lead to in the issue of mental health or mental illness? Thank you very much. I, I think... Um... It might be very funny to say a, a lot of uh, I saw in an in an article somewhere that uh, a, uh, about a quarter of men mm. also undergo domestic violence uh, from their partner, yeah, uh, or wife or spouse, yeah. And I initially I found it very difficult to believe initially. Why? Because, exactly because it's not it's something that you would not expect the kind of a. Uh, Paternalistic society thinks for the men, man to, to be laid hands on. <laughs> to be laid hand on the woman rather than the, the other way around. But the, the issue of domestic violence actually happened to men also. It's just that how how does it feel uh, to go to your colleague to say, look, do you know what? My wife is beating me. So most men will not. It's not, it's not a laughing matter. Uh, 
Yeah. You better tell them if she's beating you before before she knows yeah. you out completely. So most people most people will find that difficult to to address in that way, but that does not mean uh, it doesn't go on. And domestic violence is not just physical beating, uh, a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of uh, financial verbal abuse, abuse, verbal abuse. So it goes on, and um, women too are, I mean, perpetrators in those uh, in those in those areas, but it's less reported, and because men will not uh, admit to that. In fact, rather than men to allow uh, a spouse to do that to them, they will probably have resulted to physical violence and serious emotional abuse. In fact, actually, sexual abuse also. So it, it goes on in society on both sides. Mm. I think what is important is the. Uh, to know that it doesn't just happen by itself, it, it does have implications also mm. because uh, domestic violence also can lead to men mental health problems. People become very sad, very depressed, very stressed, lose their self-esteem, lose mm. their self-worth. Mm. They don't want to go out, they can't face the society. People call off safe from work. If somebody has just got a, a black high, obviously they, they don't want to go to work for that or they start giving excuses, they're falling down the staircase, that's why they mm. happen, or they just bang their head on the wall or things like that. So, and they internalize the problem, particularly if there's no somebody, if there's nobody there for them to express their distress to. Mm. They internalize the problem and you get anxious. If they are unfortunate enough to still be living in the same house yeah. with, this, with this person, mm. they have nowhere to escape to. A lot of women, and sometimes men are trapped in that situation whereby they have to think about their financial survival, they have to think about mm. child care, where do their children go to school, where do they live. So people ask me questions, but well, why don't the women live? And I say to them, you don't understand. Women cannot just live because a lot of things is tied to the, their living in mm. terms of financial status, survival, children, child care. And also some women don't want to deprive their children of their fathers. So. They are, they, are, they are tied into that situation whereby they cannot live and they internalize the problem, they endure it, and uh, they become depressed. Some women become psychotic in that process of being, uh, uh, being, being abused. People have post-traumatic stress disorder you know, in that situation also. And uh, sadly, some women and some men also have been killed in, in domestic violence. Wow. I think... Uh, aside from today's program, I think we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to work on doing a, maybe two, three programs on domestic violence because it's, it, it, like I said, it's something that is very, very ripe in the society generally today. So uh, look out for that. Now, as we begin to round up, doctor, we've talked about all this issue with mental health and mental illness. And some of the symptoms that you've mentioned and the experience and, and, and that you've shared with us. We've also talked about if somebody, if you know of somebody who is in that position, how do you help them and how do you relate to them? But outside of my personal relationship or relating to that person or giving that person help, what are the organizations, what organizations are out there that people can go to, that people can call. I know of the Samaritans. I know of going to your GP and all of that. But from your professional knowledge and experience, what are the other avenues where people can seek help from? I think the, the, before we start going to an organization, the, the first avenue for people is to speak to their family, to speak to their friends, because these are people that are likely to be away, are available 24-7. Okay. There are a lot of organizations out there that are doing a lot of good work. You mentioned the, the uh, Sam good, good Samaritans. You have well, the same. You have Mind. Mm -hmm. You have also of organizations there that are they are in the society to look after mentally ill people and to signpost them to where they need to go to. So mm -hmm. but the first point of call is to speak to our family because a lot of people that have mental disorder they don't need to see a doctor. Sometimes people just need somebody to share their problem with mm -hmm. and reassure them. Uh, if everybody who has a mental disorder has to go to a hospital or see a GP, society will not be able to cope with that. So a lot of things resolve at the level of talking to somebody, sharing their problem, practical, practical problem solving, you know, help in one form or the other, mm. sometimes finances being sorted out, mm. you know, 
arranged in a different way, finding a job, you know, finding a child, child minder, you know, all sort of practical problems that people that are putting people under stress, you know, mm. can be addressed by talking to people and then talking to all these organizations. Sometimes the GP doesn't have the answer. Sometimes problems are caused originally by practical issues like money, like childcare, like pressure at work, like discrimination, you know, like abuse and bullying at work. People mm -hmm. need to address all of this. And if you belong to an organization at work whereby you feel you are being bullied, it's causing you a lot of stress. You wake up on Monday morning, you don't feel like going to work. You need to talk to your line manager. You need to look for the bullying policy at your workplace and get help in those directions. So all the help is not just mental health services. You can get help in all sorts of places because sometimes the problems are caused by other real problems and that they need to be dealt with practically. I just, I am, I am, I am so grateful, Doctor, for for the fact that you've taken your time out to be with us today. Uh, there is no amount of book I could have read to prepare me and put me in a position where I can deliver what you have done for us tonight. Uh, there is no, for me to even be a nurse, a, a, a psychiatric nurse, I have to first go to at least four or five years uh, education. Uh, and here we are having it easy, having it for free from uh, Dr. Olu um, I, I really appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. But just okay. before we go, when I was uh, just going over my preparation for, for this program, I came across a, a, a survey or a test online where it says, how much do you know about mental illness? Take the mental quiz to see how much you know. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I took the test. I just barely scraped through. But what it did was it opened my eyes to a lot of things that even in all of my preparation, I didn't see in the articles and the books and the journals that I've read. So I'm, at the end of the program, I'm going to put that, the link to that uh, website. I'm going to put it on my, on my timeline. It will take you about maybe five minutes, 10 maximum, depending on how fast you go. To go through, it's about 10 or 15 questions, but they will help you to understand deeper about mental illness. They will help you to appreciate the lives of the people that are going through it. But more than that, it will open your eyes and put tools in your hands that you can use to help them, to even help yourself. If you're not going to do it for anybody else, do it for yourself. So that web link will be on my timeline after the program. Oh, I feel like we should continue talking and talking and talking, Doctor. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great to have Dr. Olu Moroti with us. Also, before I go, I want to mention that Dr. Lumoroti is not just a, a consultant in the, in the mental health field. Uh, I have had the privilege of enjoying one of his other services. The first book that I published, Dr. Lumoroti was the brain behind editing, formatting, uh, proofreading, oh, but let me tell you, if you're going to work with Dr. Lumoroti, your patience will be long because he will see everything. He will point out everything. But I'm grateful, sir, for the work you did on my book. Uh, it has put the book in a better position than I could have done myself. I'm saying that because I know a lot of people in this time are writing books or want to write books or thinking of writing a book. Dr. Lumoroti is your best person. I can say that from experience when it comes to just the knowledge of knowing how to write a book before you even talk of publishing it. Thank God for KDP, Amazon, for self-publishing and all of that. But you see, the quality of the product will determine the market that it, it, it attracts. 
So I highly, highly recommend Dr. Lumoroti's uh, uh, service in that regard. So please take advantage of it. I said at the beginning that Dr. Lumoroti has spoken into my life over the years, and I honored his wisdom. Uh, he's not opening a clinic for counseling. But if you need help, if you just want to talk to somebody, Dr. Lumoroti will be there, will give you his ears. And I can, I can vouch for the quality of the advice you get from him. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in saying thank you to Dr. Lomoroti for this time. Sir, don't go far. We will be asking you to come back very soon. And please tell Dr. Lomoroti too that uh, her turn is coming because <laughs> we, we, have to be, we have to become better in who we are. We have to become better in what we do. We have to become better in how we do them. And some of this knowledge, we can't read them in books. We don't even have the time to read the books. But when we have people like you on a, on a, on a platform like this, it, it makes the world a better place. Sir, on behalf of everybody, thank you. Thank you, thank for, you. for the wisdom, the knowledge, and the impartation that you've added to us. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. God bless you and your family. Thank you. Well, Bye. ladies and gentlemen, I don't have anything else to say but to tell you, we are people on a journey. We have a destination that is set before us. We have an assignment that we must deliver. But you see, the ability to deliver, the ability to complete, the ability to be successful is a function of what we are because you can only give what you have. And that is the essence of this platform, that you and I become better primarily at who we are. And out of that who we are, we can then start to produce what we have. So until we meet again next time, this is Tunde Disu saying, don't give up. Don't cave in. Don't throw, don't throw, in, the, don't throw in the towel. There's a purpose in for your life. There's a reason you're on this planet. There's a reason why you are where you are right now. And there is no telling where you and I will be. But one thing I know, when we arrive at that destination, every man, every woman will have no choice but to say, surely, for truth, truthfully, these are better men and better women. I'll see you again next week. God bless you. Thank you, doctor. Have a great okay. one. Please share this program with your friends. Tell somebody about it. Bye-bye for now. God bless Bye. you. Bye.